Michael Goyet, Portfolio Manager at Toroso Investments Returns. Michael, good to have you. Last time you were on the show, you left us on a cliffhanger, and I promised you and the audience we'd come back and touch on that, and I'm making good on that promise. You said that we are about to enter a sovereign debt crisis in the United States. And by the way, that's a conversation maybe for another day. I have to tell you, the way the dollar has acted this year, it's almost like it's sensing some kind of sovereign debt crisis. So it's important to note that the U.S. has, in throughout its history, a few instances of defaults in various forms. So the first would be 1812. The second would be 1933, when Roosevelt took steps to remove the U.S. government off the gold standard. And in 1979, there were what's called the mini defaults, where a certain number of our small number of holders of Treasury securities uh, weren't paid back. I think it was a technical default. Maybe they were paid back eventually. There's a good article on this uh, written by the U.S. Congress that I'll link in the description down below for those of us watching who like to learn more. But basically, Michael, what I like to ask you is uh, which of these instances you can draw a parallel to the most in today's situation and why you think we're about to enter another U.S. sovereign debt crisis. All right. So there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, um, there are many types of sovereign debt, uh, debt crises. One yes. is, you know, technical default, right? Which is, to your point, sort of a delay on on payments, and then a hard default, and then restructuring, kind of like what we saw with with Greece, right, in 2011, 2012. So the um, I, I think there's two sources through which there's some potential tail risk with a sovereign debt crisis. Let's talk about the U.S. first, then we'll get into the international side. So to your point about the U.S., I just ran this stat. I put it on my Twitter at Lee Lag Report account. If you were to look at the percentage of weeks as a percentage of the year, the amount of times that yields have risen, right? Meaning that treasuries have lost money, yields have risen, that which the US government uses basically to fund its deficits. You've never had a time in history where 68% of the weeks in any single year yields rose. Now, why is that consequential? Because if yields keep rising like this with $30 trillion, trillion of, of debt, never mind the unfunded liabilities, that means that suddenly, as that $30 trillion of debt needs to be rolled over, now it's going to have to be on a higher interest expense. This is a real, real big issue because U.S. government can't pay that off. And if interest expense ends up being as large as your taxpayer base and you're unequivocally in you know, real default risk territory, or at least maybe a Japan-like scenario where you have uh, just a terrible environment for, for many, many years to come. The bigger issue, though, I think, is that you have a real strain on the international side. Right? We know that a lot of sovereign international entities borrow in dollars for debt. And as they scramble for dollars, as the dollar itself keeps on rallying and rising and their currencies depreciate, there becomes a real funding strain for these economies that don't have the luxury of being the reserve currency and that cannot rely on modern monetary theory to pay off those liabilities. So we are in this really, really nasty situation. I keep going back to this point that you've never had a period where your starting point of leverage is so high, you've got higher interest expense, collapsing tax receipts because capital gains are evaporating, and everyone just being apathetic to the idea that maybe things will be okay when it really may not be. To your point about uh, the U.S. not being able to afford higher interest expenses, yes, I've heard that before, but isn't it true that uh, the uh, higher interest rates only apply to new debt? Yes, but the problem is if everything is based on uh, the new debt, which includes mortgage rates, which includes uh, all the other very big purchases for, purchase for the economies, the new debt is what sets the marginal rate for everybody else in terms of that which ultimately taxes are based off of. Right. That's the real issue. Right. So it's more than just the interest expense. It's about what does the higher interest expense mean on revenue also from the taxpayer perspective. So you end up getting to the same place of some kind of potential crisis. I, the, the issue for me is the dollar acting the way it is. I keep going back to this point. Most sovereign debt crises are preceded by currency volatility first. You look at the yen, you look at the euro. There is real, real strain going on outside the U.S. And I don't know. It's. It seems really bizarre to be the complacency when it comes to the stock market because everything around the stock market is screaming and the stock market's not really listening. Okay. Well, let's talk about uh, a few things that you've, you, you mentioned here. So first of all, let's go back to your earlier point about uh, the Treasury securities, uh, the, the research that you've done. I think you went back to 19, 1961 and uh, – 
I'll let you I'll talk about your research, but uh, you calculated the uh, percentage of weeks throughout the year on an, uh, on an average basis where Treasury securities have lost money. And you said that this is unprecedented. Yeah, so, so and this I've said many times is my hell. If anybody uh, is being cynical about what I have to say, I'm very open about this. The problem in my role from a risk on risk off perspective, all the funds that you see behind me, is they're all predicated on the idea that treasuries act as the risk off safe haven. But if you're in a year where treasuries are losing money week after week after week in such an unrelenting way, in a way that history would never suggest has ever happened, that becomes wildly difficult to rotate around equities and treasuries trying to play defense with that which is supposed to be the safe haven asset, quote unquote, right? At least for now. So what we have seen here really has never really happened ever, including in the 1970s. I have people saying to me, well, you know, this is to be expected in an inflationary bear market or an inflationary recession. First of all, it's not even clear we're in a recession, number one. And two, uh, in the 70s, you never saw this either, right? And it relates to a lot of the other research I've put out there, which shows that the drawdown correlation of equities to treasuries has been wildly extreme, something we've never have seen before as well. So make no mistake about it, what's happening this year really has never happened before. There are no parallels. And where that should, I think, worry people is if the anomaly, which is this interaction of treasuries to stocks, which has been my hell this year, if this anomaly were to continue, you better worry about more than just your portfolios. You cannot have a system where rates rise, stocks fall, recession comes, and then, oh, by the way, uh, we keep on increasing spending to try to fix problems that were the result of spending to begin with. And it's not just US-based phenomena. This is a global phenomenon. So I'm not trying to be overly panicked here. My, my, my hope, and hope people could say is not a strategy, but in reality, you have to hope the cycle comes to you. My hope is that this anomaly ends, that we're not headed for that sovereign debt crisis, or maybe that if we are, that treasuries actually do what they're supposed to do, which is act as the quote unquote safe haven. Because right. if you have a sovereign debt crisis, that's a deflation scare that's still coming. And that deflation scare can get really, really nasty. Okay. So let's go back to your point about uh, yields rising and the uh, U.S. Treasury not being able to afford interest expenses. So two points here. I'll touch the first one. Um, I presume that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury communicate. Um, they're not completely foreign entities to one another. If the Treasury makes a calculation and says that at some point we can't pay back debt, this is getting too expensive. Won't they send a memo to Jerome Powell and ask him to stop raising rates? All right. So first of all, on the uh, on the Treasury and the Fed speaking to each other, that's like me talking to myself because it's effectively one and the same. Okay. Um, you you you'd be correct on that on that thinking. Yes, of course they would. But but inflation is still very elevated. It's a catch twenty two. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. So if you have a situation where the U.S. government uh, tax base is not unable to cover your interest expense. Sure, then the argument's going to be the Fed will just simply subsidize that. Well, the problem is then now you've got more than just the starting debt of $30 trillion. You Now you've got starting inflation at that point of a much higher level than ever before than we've seen. That's sticky. Right. So you can't win in that kind of scenario. And, and uh, you know, I, I know people have been talking about the end game, the great reset and all this stuff. I'm not necessarily in that in that mindset, in that camp, but I sympathize unequivocally with that view because when you look at the way correlations have broken down and the way that the Fed is really stuck here. Yeah, I can kind of see why everyone, you know, at the real extreme, those that have been deemed to be the crazies, right, in the world of finance may end up actually getting the last laugh. But the problem is you don't want to have that last laugh because it means we have much bigger problems to worry about. So just going off your analogy of you talking to yourself. So in this case, you're having an uh, existential moment to yourself. You're talking to yourself in the mirror and you're asking yourself, do I raise rates and fight inflation? Or do I not raise rates and let inflation run? Now, in the first scenario, if I raise rates, I could potentially bankrupt my own bank account. What do I do? Right, that's exactly the, right. That's the moral question you're asking yourself. Right, exactly. And that, and that is the catch-22. And, and I keep going back to this point, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic with this, but if the inflation sticks around as elevated as it is, and the choice is to, to subsidize right, those higher rates by the Fed trying to suppress long, the long end, again, with QE instead of QT, meaning they reverse course, and inflation doesn't come down. People have to be really careful about um, how despotism happens, right? I mean, conditions create the, the monster, right? Oh. And in that case, what I'm really referring to is the Weimar Republic is what created the conditions for Hitler's rise to power. I'm not saying you get to that point, obviously, but do not underestimate how uh, how devastating inflation can be towards uh, 
psyche and how that can result in conditions for something we don't want to ever see in any democracy or in any country. Inflation is a process. You can't necessarily get rid of it that easily. And if that process were to persist, and if politicians keep doing the same stupid asinine things they keep doing to throw more fuel on this inflationary fire and calling it an Inflation Reduction Act, you better believe there's real risk that you could have something really, really ugly we've never seen in America before. You always do this. You like, you go off on this tangent, and then it would be irresponsible for me not to address what you just said because it's critically important. So let's. I want to keep coming back. I want to keep coming back. (laughs) Okay, we need to discuss that. You can't just leave me on another cliffhanger. So despotism. Uh, uh, All right. So. There, there are numerous studies and academic research done on this topic, how uh, economic instability have led to the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, let's link this back to America. I know you're not trying to be overly dramatic, and you know one could argue we don't have an authoritarian regime right now, but you're saying we're on this path, if I understand you correctly? What I'm saying is that inflation, if inflation is not contained, if it stays elevated, and if the policymakers keep doing the wrong things, and if the Fed... Uh, does not really get ahead of this. You end up entrenching inflation in the psyche of the American public and in, okay. in the entire world. And and you've seen this on the periphery with some of these protests and and real violent type of actions against local governments, which you hope doesn't happen, right? I'm not saying that that's, that's going to come. What I'm saying is that if this inflation uh, issue isn't resolved uh, sooner than later, the odds, even though they might be low, do rise for that kind of a environment where somebody could come in and suddenly, something much more severe comes from a from a government's government uh, standpoint, governance standpoint. So again, it's not a base case, but I, this goes back to the point about well, so if the U.S. government is not going to be able to cover its interest expense with uh, higher taxes, the Fed will simply do it for them. But it, again, it, it, that means that inflation is going to be the end result of that. And if the end, infl- end result of that is inflation that's elevated, the end result of elevated inflation over time is, again, something that we don't want to see, which could be the rise of real, real uh, despotism. Okay, so that's your worst case scenario. Let's talk about that. How do we get there, the rise of despotism in the U.S.? So inflation doesn't get... Let's let's suppose the Fed or the government, we'll come back to this, but the Fed and the government fail to bring down inflation. We get mass riots, change of government, um, potentially another Weimar Republic comes into power and tries to appeal to the public that they're going to fix inflation and then we vote in a despot. Is that what's going to happen? Well, I hope it's not going to happen. But, you know, it's funny. It, it, let's, let's, let's just relate it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's just but let's, let's relate that. Here, no, yeah. No, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a thought experiment. But, but they're, the, let's relate it back to the sovereign uh, uh, crisis, sovereign sure, debt yeah. crisis. So, again, I go back to inflation is a process, but deflation tends to be an event, right, which would be a crisis, a sovereign debt crisis where, let's say, some – emerging economy or uh, whatever just simply can't pay off its dollar denominated debt. I mean, that's one way of, of eliminating excess liquidity, right? If you have a default by some sovereign entity outside the US, which oddly enough, then you can argue you actually kind of want to see, right? It's like if, if the Fed is not going to break inflation, maybe default from a government would, right? Outside the US, right? So there's, look, again, my only point in, in saying this is emphasizing this point that one, we're in really uncharted territory. I know everybody always says that in extremes, but I can prove it data-wise that when you look at treasuries, you look at the interaction of stocks, to treasuries, you look at debt, you look at the dollar, all the stuff that's happening all at once is like multiple black swans or tail risks or anomalies all appearing at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. Under that kind of a scenario, nobody knows what's going to come next, but you know that if it persists, what's going to come next is probably going to be pretty ugly. Right? That's all I'm trying to address. We have to hope that's not the case. You never want to bet on something like that happening because it doesn't matter what the value of your portfolio is under those types of real scary scenarios. But you have to at least be aware of it and root for things to actually end up being better right? than worse. Right. Okay. Uh, let's suppose, again, that inflation is not fixed right away or in the uh, foreseeable future, uh, and we get uh, mass riots or protests Let's say we get protests on Capitol Hill in D.C., and people would demand that the government fix inflation, not the Fed, but the government. What can Congress do about it? What will they do about it in that scenario? Fire themselves. Right? <laughs> They're not going like, to do that. <laughs> no, 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 but I'm actually kind of serious about that because it's like, you know, uh, look, again, inflation is a process, not an event. So, you know, the reality is it has to be shared pain. But in order to have that shared pain, you have to stop spending it's not just commodities, 
right? When you have 170 trillion, depending on what estimates you're looking at, of unfunded liabilities, 30 trillion dollars of visible uh, liabilities, right? That we can see based on the U.S. debt clock. It's like, how could that not be inflationary? And the only way to resolve that is to pay down that debt, right? So that's that's kind of the joke about the Inflation Reduction Act. The best way to have reduction of inflation is to reduce your damn debt, not spend more, right? And okay. by the way, that's not a political statement. Both parties suck. They both keep increasing debt, no matter what. It's a problem. Let's talk about that. What are the uh, what are the ways that the government can reduce their debt? Yeah. So so look, the reality is, I mean, and this is why there's going to be a lot of pain. A lot of the dynamics around Social Security probably needs to be rethought or refigured out. A lot of the dynamics around uh, U.S. military probably needs to be rethought, figured out, because all of these add to uh, the deficit side. And the reality is. You know, look, the Fed is the enabler, right, in terms of reckless fiscal policy, because the Fed basically tells uh, the entire world that in the event that things hit the fan, uh, they're going to come in and save the system in lower rates. And those cheap rates are, at the end of the day, what's going to keep on uh, increasing the incentive to leverage more and spend more and buy votes by promising more. So the other part of this is it's not just a government uh, solution, which is some degree of discipline on that side. You also need to have discipline by the Fed, right? Which, by the way, is kind of the, the Bitcoin maximalist argument that you need to have a hard currency where there's a set supply uh, to enforce discipline by code. I don't disagree with that narrative. I disagree with a lot of other things around the Bitcoin narrative, but uh, that's one man's opinion. But the, the, the broader point here is, look, we are always told inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It is not a monetary phenomenon. Inflation is, was, and always will be a discipline and leadership phenomenon. Yeah, and you can't really do that if you simply get voted into power by promising more and the Fed enables it. And again, I go back to the end result of all this is either some kind of sovereign de de default crisis, right, which is the deflation event, or the exact opposite, which is hyperinflation, which results in the conditions under which something really uh, bad uh, comes, some, something bad happens in terms of a new leader that you don't want to see lead, right? Mm -hmm. Again, I go back to history. My point in this is that when you have so much leverage, and the only way you resolve the extreme is with another extreme. The question is, which way? I'm going to come back to that and uh, the sovereign debt crisis, and we'll close off on the, uh, your, your, your uh, scenario here. Um, uh, one could argue there's another theory that uh, the U.S. government wants inflation because that is another way to wipe off debt, right? Yeah, I've, I've, always, had a, I've always had an intellectual problem with that because it's like, all right, what's the mechanism there? So if you have inflation... That means that as the as the government taxes, right, they're getting more dollars because presumably wages are where the inflation is coming in. But that's not really the case. And who cares if inflation erodes debt if you keep spending to counter it? I mean, it, it makes no sense to me. It's like, okay, inflation is the only way out of this. Okay, but if they keep on increasing liabilities at a faster pace than the inflation, mm. then your net liabilities keep increasing. Okay, that, that's a fair point. Okay, so coming back to your sovereign debt crisis uh, scenario, how does this play out exactly? How will the U.S. default? I mean, will they default? First of all, that, that's, I'm, I don't want to make that assumption. What are the mechanisms to deal with this sovereign debt crisis, default being one of them? What other ways can they cope? Okay, I, I think, well, just to be clear, I think that it's more likely that, that an international entity, an emerging economy, defaults more than the U.S., but obviously okay. the U.S., especially with rates rising the way that it is, there is a pot potential scenario where if the Fed decides to be disciplined, which would be a surprise, right, that yes, you could have delays on interest uh, uh, payments by the Treasury. Uh, but again, when you're a reserve currency, you can still print currency, right, to cover that. So if in the real extreme, if you're ever really going to have a default in the U.S., it's probably going to be more technical in the sense that it's a delay of payment as opposed to not getting back your principal. But it's interesting too, right, because if inflation's elevated, your principal, you're not getting your principal back anyway, right? Because your 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 principal that you're you're lending to the government with treasuries ends up being eroded by uh, the higher cost of everything else. So there's a lot of insidious ways that that a government can be uh, defaulted without sort of an outright uh, cancellation of uh, what was given to the government uh, from an investment perspective. And of course, if they issue some sort of default, mini or otherwise, or if they delay payments, uh, that would be unprecedented in many, you know, in, in, in many senses of the word, and that would cause a huge spike in interest rates because trading partners and debt holders, sovereign debt holders of U.S. debt, would demand higher interest rates to compensate for this new risk that the U.S. is all of a sudden not safe, not risk-free anymore. 
And so the interest expenses on the U.S. would then skyrocket again, would it not? Right. And, so, and, and that's why it's like an apocalyptic end of the world type of scenario where the value of our portfolio doesn't matter. I don't think that's going to be the case, just to be clear. But yes. I keep going back to the way the, the emerging markets international side is feeling this kind of strain is very significant. If inflation keeps getting entrenched and it's not broken soon, you're going to have other longer term problems. And if you end up having more stupidity by our uh, policymakers around what they think is meant to stop inflation, you're going to have real societal unrest. And that becomes really, really problematic, again, beyond the value of our stocks and bonds. And I hope to God that treasuries don't uh, default, that treasuries act as the safe haven, that you end up having the return to some degree of normalcy because I'm an entrepreneur. I've got my funds that are predicated on this very idea, which is based on rules-based backtesting, that treasuries act as the safe haven, that treasuries are where you want to be when the world is ending, that it's not the source of the world ending. There are many instances of uh, modern day emerging economies uh, defaulting on domestic and in some cases external debt. So this definitely has a, a track record of happening what you're describing. Um, but coming back to the U.S. now, so what can investors do about this problem? What are the investment implications for U.S. investors given that there is a rising risk of the country entering into a sovereign debt crisis? I don't know if there's really much you can do because it's there's nowhere to hide in that place. Yeah, you can argue maybe gold. Yeah, you can maybe argue Bitcoin. I don't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, the dollar probably would uh, free fall under that scenario because there would be a flee out of currency uh, of the U.S. government if the reserve currency ends up uh, being challenged because now you've got defaults on the government side. Again, I don't think that's a possibility, but it's a non-zero probability. Um, but <laughs> Sometimes the 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 simplest answer is the right one, which is that don't think about betting on that or what do you do with it, because I don't think you can do much because it's a shared hell that everyone would then live in under that environment for a prolonged period of time. That's a generational hell. Sometimes the simplest answer is don't bet on it and actually bet the things will somewhat somewhat normalize because that's the, again, that's the joke of the end of the world, which I would argue that kind of scenario is. It only happens once. So what's the point in betting on it? So it's not your base case scenario. So there's no there's no point preparing for this is what you're saying. Yeah, because, because we're all screwed. I mean, there's no other way to say it right, if that's the case, right? I mean, it's, it's just fact. Okay. I mean, do I stay in cash then? I mean, that doesn't make any sense because cash is getting no, eroded no, by I, 7% a year. No, and, and again, I go back to that's part of the argument for gold and Bitcoin, right? I, I get it, right? To, uh, things that are, quote unquote, off the grid that won't have uh, confiscation issues. Hard assets, I, I know, farmland, hard real assets, estate. Yeah. And, and honestly, skill, right? Because it's like, okay. I think a lot of people are, 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 too busy being keyboard warriors instead of focusing on themselves and their own growth and their own ability to survive in the event that you know you have an apocalyptic financial system reset. Well, let's let's talk about that briefly. I mean, looking forward, not, not just financial advice, but I guess career advice, if you want to call it that. If you if you look at where the world is headed towards the next couple of decades, uh, the larger themes and the bigger trends that society uh, needs to pay attention to. What would you advise somebody entering college right now to do? to not rely on anybody else but themselves. So th this is this is a broader theme for me personally. You've got to be your own backup. I think the problem society-wise in the U.S. and everywhere is that everyone is now relying on uh, big daddy government to come in and help them out in the event that there's a crisis in their own personal lives, right? And I don't disagree. The government is oftentimes the source of those crises, okay? But at the end of the day, there has to be self-reliance, right? And that's a mindset. That's not yeah. necessarily a a to-do list of things for somebody in terms of what they should be focusing on. They have to focus on themselves first and take uh, responsibility for their own lives instead of simply giving up their own sovereignty to their sovereign governments. I'm going to read you this uh, title from a Bloomberg article that came out recently. Gen Z wants to ditch corporate jobs for influencing social media dreams. All right, I'm just going to read you the first paragraph. America's youngest uh, workers want to become business owners, just not in the way their parents might envision. Their drive to turn social media posts into sustainable income is highest among the youngest generation of workers, according to new research by Adobe Inc. About 45% of Gen Z creators surveyed said they aspire to own a business and make money from content shared online. According to the company's survey, it may have more than 9,000 influencers and creators across nine countries. I, I, I get that that number is a bit skewed because they targeted younger people that are already sure. influencers. But um, you know, I'll give you a personal anecdote. I got my haircut a while ago. Um, and, Love uh, your haircut, as I said before. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you. 
Uh, if everybody online could share your sentiment, that would be great. No, I'm kidding. But uh, the, put your my, comments my point down is, below. Comments yeah, down put below. your comments down below. My 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 hair is my co-anchor. Uh, but um, my uh, my barber told me her seven-year-old son wants to be a YouTuber and discuss finance. I said, really? And then yeah, she was spitting facts about uh, Elon Musk and Tesla. And I'm like, how do you how do you know all this? And I said, well, she said my, my seven year old son was doing research and told me all this about Tesla. And I felt kind of threatened because I'm not you know I'm not seven years old and this guy <laughs> apparently knows just as much as me. I mean, the next generation of making the point want to do stuff that is again unprecedented because this 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 field of work, if you want to call it that, didn't exist 40 years ago, right? Yeah, that, that that's probably why. The bear market is not over, by the way, uh, in all sincerity, right? Because it's like, this is not going to end until this stupid shit ends. I'm sorry, but it's like, and, and I get it. Listen, you can argue I'm an influencer myself. I've got, you know, 700,000 Twitter followers roughly. And I've got a you know, big, big uh, audience myself. Huge follower. I, I do it as a business. Right, but, but, but I do it as a business, right? Because I'm, I'm, I myself put research out, which is separate from my funds. And I, you know, I'm hoping that people look at my funds and even though they've gone through hell and this horrible environment with treasuries and equities that, you know, that drawdown still means people will actually buy the drawdown, which is what pros do as opposed to amateurs that sell a drawdown. But, you know, when you have these, you know, respectfully uh, kids uh, and people who don't spend the time and effort uh, in this very serious domain of investing, and it's all about gamification, how, I, I don't see how you have a healthy environment unless that that stupidity ends. Okay, well, sorry. What 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 exactly? What what is the stupidity you're referring to? The uh... that it, that it that it's a game that you can simply just look at what Elon Musk is saying. That you can go right. into some random shit coin in the cryptocurrency space. That you can right. that it's all that that everyone wants to be an influencer and show how great their trades are when probably it's all randomness and luck. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is like. You know what it is? This is like the modern version of the odd lot theory. Okay, so it used to be the argument back in the day that if uh, individual, if you saw a lot of odd lots under 100 share type of trades, buys in a particular stock or sells, that it's a contrarian indicator. Because the argument with the odd lot indicator was yeah. very simple. right? If you can't afford very much, you don't know that much about investing, which there's a logic to that or money management. So the, 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 all these small share buys is really sort of a, a contrarian uh, signal, right? Because it means uneducated speculators uh, are just gambling to some extent and just you know throwing money into the market. So this is like the modern version of that, right? So uh, until you have the real pain to remind people that it's not all about you know uh, rocket ships and going to the moon and all this nonsense that really started heavily last year, and, well, and this focus on being an influencer as opposed to producing things. The, right? the, the, the by the way, I get the, I get the simple. The counter Sorry, argument I heard is that uh, meme stock investing is now. Not it's not just a real thing, but it's something everyone needs to study and incorporate into their analysis because it's so important. I mean, the odd lot argument it makes sense, but the, now we're in an extreme example of the odd lot uh, environment where we have uh, we have low cost uh, retail uh, trading apps like Robinhood opening up trading to the masses. It's not just amateur investors now; it's anybody with money who basically wants to take part in the economy or gamble or trade uh, for fun. And they're following what? They're following Wall Street bets. They're following social media influencers online on TikTok, Instagram, telling them what to do. They're probably watching shows like this one, learning. I hope they're learning. Um, I don't know. But uh, anyway, they're trying to find information on the internet and learn and make trades according to whatever they listen to. Now, the herd is very powerful, some might argue. We saw that with GameStop, AMC. And so you don't want to fight the herd, like just like just like how you don't want to fight the Fed. You want to actually follow what the odd lots are doing now in today's environment. How would you respond to that argument? You use the two words which are exactly the issue, which is gamble and fun. This is not supposed to be fun. I know that sounds really strange, but it's like this is a very serious endeavor. It's not just prices on a screen. It's not just being able to buy and sell. I mean, you talk about what is essentially a, a a way of looking at capitalism to some extent, real time, right? It's it, it, stock movement, stock prices, market cap. They give important signals on the economy. They are important signals on the economy. And it's supposed to be serious because you're putting capital at risk. It's not just, uh, you know, the, I, I don't know. I, 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 maybe this is just me being an old man yelling at the cloud. Well, right? do you so, think that, do you think that retail investors as a collective can be more powerful as a market influence?
or force, if you want to call it that, than traditional institutional funds? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. And I, I go back to that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is in the world of influencers, going back to that point and this sort of um, uh, glorification by likes and retweets of the person that is saying that Tesla is going to triple mm. in the next four months, mm. then that creates distortions. And it's the distortions that create the ugliness that ultimately becomes a butterfly effect that results in the Fed having to then react or creates excessive leverage in other parts of the marketplace, which then have knock-on effects on the institutions that do take it seriously, right? That's sort of the issue. I am 100% all for retail getting involved and educating. I'm not interested in retail entertaining. Okay, interesting. Another cliffhanger that we'll hopefully address next time. Thank you, Michael, as always. To thank be you continued for your thoughts. again. To be continued. To be continued. Stay tuned for more here at Kitco News. I'm David Lin.